Y'all come in, grab a seat. While you're doing that, let's uh, let's stand, let's sing our opening song. Come, let us worship the Lord, for we are His people, the flock that He shepherds. Come, let us worship the Lord, for we are His people, flock that He shepherds. Good morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name's Ben, and we are thrilled to have you worshiping with us here at Redeemer this morning. Whether you're here in the room or still joining us uh, on the, the internet here this morning, if you didn't get a chance, there's still coffee in the back, maybe a few donuts left over. Uh, you can put on a name tag, get to know those around you. But it is the Lord's Day. So let us hear his good words as he reminds us who he is and why we worship. So let's hear and respond to our call to worship this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. For your light has come, and the glory of God is on you. Arise, see when the earth grows dark, that the Lord will arise upon you. The Lord will arise upon you. Nations will come to your light.
with me. God, as we enter into this place, we come from, from all different emotional and, uh, and physical places, places of sickness and health, places of, of belief and places of unbelief. God, some of us come from places of angst and some from security, some from loneliness and some with full hearts. And yet for each of us here this morning, you have invited us into this place so that you can draw us into you, into your family, into your love, into the work of redemption that you are doing in our world. And so, Father, I pray that you would use this service as ordinary as it is to do the extraordinary work of your spirit in our lives to remind us of Jesus to remind us of the what he has done in our world, to remind us of what he is doing, and to draw our hearts once again to him and his coming kingdom. And so, Father, we join with his disciples, the men and women who have followed him from his days on earth, praying the prayer that he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, when we get together on Sunday mornings, one of the rhythms, one of the habits we do together as a church family is we have a prayer of confession. Now, maybe in your life you don't typically gather and, and say in public spaces um, that I have failed, that I am evil, that I've done what is evil in the world. Maybe this isn't your habit to, to, to stand, uh, say, out loud in front of friends and neighbors and say, I have screwed up in the world. And yet we all know that we have. Whether you're a, a religious person or not, whether you have uh, been exposed to church or not, you can't even do the good things that you know that you you ought to do. You can't treat people the way that you want to treat them. Those explosions of anger, those explosions of malice seep into our lives. But the question is, is where do we go? Where do we go to, to be made right? Where do we go to, to, to have the world put back together again? And when we confess our sins, what we are saying is, is that there's only one place to go with our failures. There's only one place to go with our shame. And that is to our Heavenly Father. So if you're here this morning and you need to be forgiven, I invite you to join with me in our prayer of confession. Have mercy on us, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is always before us. Against you, you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely we were sinful at birth, 
sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach us wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse us with hyssop, and we will be clean. Wash us, and we will be whiter than snow. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Well, we can lift up our eyes and we can lift up our hearts because we have been given the assurance of God's pardoning grace. Let's hear it from 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. And as God uh, assures us of his grace, we in turn have his peace. And that peace, as God gives it to us, is a peace that we can share with one another. So may the peace of Christ always be with you. you. Take just a minute, stand and greet those near you in that peace that our Lord gives us. All right, let's come back together if we can. All right, let's come back together. Let's stay standing and let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here and want to welcome you to Redeemer. You should have a little black book somewhere on your row. If you don't mind, pick that up and fill that out. Let us know who you are. This is just, a, again, a helpful way for us to get to know you and also a helpful way for you to get to know us if you want to be included on mailing lists and kind of be updated on what's going on in the life of Redeemer. Uh, If you're new to Redeemer, you don't know who we are. Uh, Redeemer is a church, and what that means is we're a community of people who are trying to learn how to love God, and we're trying to learn how to love our neighbors. And the way that we go about doing that here is that we, we get together like we're doing every single week so that we can worship God and rest in the love that he has for us. But Redeemer is not just a worship service. We, we want to create spaces where we spend our lives with each other. And so we get together with one another throughout the week, and we pray together, and we grill hot dogs and brats together to get ready for uh, July 4th. We blow up fireworks together with one another, and we do all of this 
so that we would remind each other in these small ways uh, that we are loved by God. But we're, we're also not a community that just exists for us. We, we want to be a group of people who spread throughout Midtown in service and in pursuing justice and getting to know our neighbors and praying for them and giving our lives away so that we would reflect the love of God for our friends and our neighbors here in Midtown. So that's kind of who we are. That's kind of what we're up to. We're, tr we're trying to learn how to love God. We're trying to learn how to love our neighbors as we rest and remind and reflect his love. And on page 10 of your bulletin, if you don't mind flipping there, I just want to highlight mm, three quick things. Uh, the first is that I want to encourage you to save the date of August 19th through 20th. If you've been around a while, you might know that back in February, we had planned on having a special weekend workshop with none other than Dr. Michael Keller. And um, he, <laughs> Ben's the only one that got that joke. Michael Keller is um, a pastor in New York. He's a friend of ours, and he's going to come down, and he was going to come down and, and spend a weekend with us talking about what does it look like now to be a church and to do ministry in a, in a post-Christian world and a kind of post-pandemic world in a world where everything has kind of changed pretty dramatically over the past few years. What does it look like to be a church in that space? And if you remember in February, there was a lot of ice and he couldn't fly out of New York and we had no power in the building and none of y'all could have driven here really anyway. So we shut it down, but we're, re, we're bringing it back. August 19th through 20th, he's coming back. We're getting Dr. Mike, and, and he'll be here with us. So save the date. Hope you can join us. We'll, we'll have a registration link available next week so that you can officially sign up and, and um, let us know that you're coming. The next thing is Youth at Redeemer. Most of you who are uh, parents or who have kids in the youth group, if this is relevant to you, hopefully you already know this. If you don't know this information and you want to be updated with youth group stuff, just email Austin Lennox. His, his uh, email address is in the back. But there's not going to be any youth group tonight. Instead, the youth group is going to the Redbirds game, which is mega fun. So if you want to be a part of that, RSVP to Austin, and uh, they'll be drop. y'all will be dropping off your kids at, you know, AutoZone Park between 5.30, 5.45, somewhere in there. Last thing I'll say is that our men's night, the second annual Greg Fokker Invitational Men's Pool Volleyball Tourney is going down soon, July 29th, into this month. Hope you can sign up, and um, it's going to be super fun. So si sign up and let us know that you're coming so that we know how much food to order for said tourney. So I think that is it for me. There's a lot of other info on there that you can read on your own, but I want to invite Dallas, who's already making his way. He already knows the drill. He's a long, he's a Redeemer OG who, who knows what he's doing, but he's going to be leading us in the um, prayers of God's people this morning. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, maker of heaven and earth and all that is in them, hear us now as we come to you in prayer. Father, send your spirit to Redeemer. Ignite our hearts with the gospel. Give us passion and vision to carry out your mission in the world, nation, our city, and our neighborhoods. We are in all of your creation. Your work amazes us over and over again. Open our hearts to see more of your grace and beauty around us. We praise you for the gifts and blessings you have provided, Redeemer. Help us to share those gifts and talents with the people around us to see your kingdom, restoration, and lives and neighborhoods. Father God, we also see the pain brought about into the world by our sin. Heal our doubts, loneliness, and addictions. Comfort the abused, sick, and mistreated, and be with those who wrestle with their faith. May Redeemer be a place to explore your truths and use us as your instruments to break the bondages of racism, injustice, and evil in this world. Father, we pray for those suffering here in Memphis and around the world. May the work of your spirit bring reconciliation, healing, and empowerment to our city. Use us to help make Memphis a place where you're known and your mercy is spread. We pray for Matt and Ben as they lead us. Give them wisdom, patience, and strength to shepherd the people of Redeemer and bless their families and help us to find ways to love and serve them. We pray for our youth and children's ministries. Thank you for the gifts Molly and Austin bring to Redeemer. Grant them your spirit's patience and love. Fill our kids with your spirit. They may not only know you and love you, but will be salt and light in their schools and friendships. We, we thank you for the gift of music that speaks to our hearts as we worship you. Thank you for blessing us with faithful, talented musicians. 
We pray for our partner, International Justice Mission. We pray that they will be granted access and avenues to free those who are locked in bondage. Weave your spirit into the local governments and positions of power to allow IJM to help restore lives. Bring your justice to those systems and power structures that allow people to be trafficked and bound in slavery. Father, teach us how to be a missional community that glorifies you, and may the work of your spirit, the Redeemer, bring reconciliation, healing, and transformation all to your glory. In your son's name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing the words of David from Psalm 51. Take all of the sin from me, for against you I am wrong. Let these bonds that you have broken rejoice, rejoice. Let me hear in joy and gladness your voice, your voice. Create in me a clean heart, God, renew your spirit in me, God. Cast me not away, O oh God, restore to me your joy. Create in me a clean heart, God, renew your spirit in me, God. Cast me not away, O oh God, restore to me your joy. Lord, my sins I know, they seem to all before me go. Not but evil flow, I can't escape the curse. You are justified, and blameless, Lord, if you decide to judge me in my hearty pride, for I was born in sin. Let these bones in you have broken, rejoice. Let me hear in joy and gladness your voice, your voice, creating me a clean heart, God. Renew your spirit in me, God. Cast me not away, oh God. Restore to me your joy. Creating me a clean heart, God. Renew your spirit in Cast me not away, oh God, restore to me your joy. Your voice, 
Kiddos who are four years old through second grade, y'all are dismissed for Children's Church at this time. Y'all can go go follow Miss Whitney right over there as they are zipping out of the room literally on wheels. Um, uh, Emma Kent, who's one of our friends and our members here, she's going to be reading our scripture passage for us this morning. From the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Emma. I don't know if you've seen the TV show, The Office, but if you're familiar, uh, there's an episode where the manager, Michael, uh, it comes to his attention that he's wearing a woman's suit. He didn't realize it. He's just, he's just showed up at work, and he's wearing a women's suit. And every, when everyone starts to notice it, they start looking closer. They start laughing. They start pointing features out that he didn't realize, like, oh, my goodness, it has shoulder pads. And uh, why are there no pockets on it? And, uh, he, he, you know, it cuts, and he explains in this kind of talking head how he acquired this suit. And here's what he says. He says, there were these huge bins of clothes, and everyone was rifling through them. It was crazy. And I grabbed one. And it fit. So I don't think it's totally just a woman's suit. At the very least, it's bisexual. (laughs) And they ask him, as they're kind of laughing and making these jokes at his expense, they're like, who made it? Who's the designer? And he opens up the coat, and it's pink. And the label right here says, Miss Tyrius. M-I-S-S, Tyrius. And he says... Uh, see, it is mysterious. That's why the buttons are on the wrong side. It's, it's a mystery. And he keeps saying it's a European cut. They don't, wear, they don't have pockets in Italy. And so there's this whole thing, and, you know, he's, he's you know, it's, it's this ridiculous moment. But I bring that up because I thought it was interesting that clothes are uh, what we use to determine who belongs, who's in and who's out. And here's somebody who's clearly wearing the wrong thing, and so everyone's laughing. They're taking out their you know, 2006 cell phones and, and taking pictures of him. And um, it's uh, clothes are what determines who's in and who's out. This is why uh, when, whenever you're invited to a party, especially in the South, you'll ask this question of like, oh, what are people wearing? 
If this is like a formal attire, you don't want to be the person that shows up in cargo shorts and flip-flops. I don't know, maybe you do. But uh, th this, what, what's fascinating about this whole thing is that this vision, you know, what we're doing this summer is we're working our way through this really strange book called Zechariah. It's in the Hebrew Scriptures, and uh, it it's comes in these kind of weird series of bizarro, wacky visions. And the vision that Emma just read for us is about somebody who's wearing the wrong clothes. It's about this high priest named Joshua who's supposed to be wearing clean stuff, and it says that he's wearing filthy stuff. And so really what, what this uh, vision is really about, it's about cleansing. It's about cleanliness. But cleanliness is really a metaphor throughout the Bible that's really about belonging. That if you are clean, you're acceptable. You're worthy. You fit. You have access into the circle. If you are unclean, you don't belong. You're unworthy. You're, you're, you're cast out. And so here's what I want to do. I want to look at cleansing really under three headings for us this morning. Why we need it in the first place. Number two, how you get it. And then number three, why it matters. Cleansing, why you need it, how to get it, why it matters. First, uh, why we need it. Well, look, look, at, look at the vision. Verse 1, Joshua was the high priest in Zechariah's day. And what that we have this picture of, he's, he's coming before the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel. He's representing his, his people to make an offering. And uh, this would have been something that the high priest would have done once a year on the um, Day of Atonement. It's a big deal. He spent, they would spend the whole week preparing, cleansing, cleaning to make himself, uh, you know, he could approach God in this kind of cleanly state because you can't just approach God on behalf of all the people as is. You can't just show up as is. So they would spend a whole week cleaning, kind of like how a surgeon can't just go into surgery just, you know, having come straight from McDonald's or whatever. They've, you got to scrub up. you got to sanitize. you got to get clean. Only here is this person who's supposed to be clean. But if you notice in verse 3, it says he's standing there with filthy garments. Now, the word filthy in Hebrew doesn't mean he has like a mustard stain on his shirt. It means something similar to, picture a porta potty that has been used at an outdoor music festival over an extended weekend, and then someone empties that porta potty on you. That's how graphic the word filthy is in Hebrew. He's covered in everything that is foul, everything that is revolting, everything that's disgusting. And so here he is, and he's representing God's people, and he's filthy. And the imagery is fairly uh, clear. The point is, is that God's people are a mess. God's people are objectively guilty before God. That's what this filth represents. It represents guilt. That God has told humanity, I want you to love God and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And we have decided to not do that. And so we are covered in our failure. We're covered in our sin. We're covered in our character defects. We are unworthy. We do not belong in God's presence. Now, I know you hear that, especially for modern ears, you, you hear that and you think, good grief, that sounds so shamey and mean and fundamentalistic. The Bible look at you and say, you, know, you are a dirty, filthy sinner. And, uh, but here's where I actually think that the Bible is tapping into something that's, that's very helpful and a, and a lot more nuanced than you might realize and, and might uh, be willing to give the Bible credit for. For example, about 10 years ago, Dove Soap did this commercial series where they brought in an FBI sketch artist. And they, they put this guy in a chair, and he had his little pad of paper right here. And then they, they had this curtain partitioning him off. And then they would bring in this woman, and she would sit down in the chair. So the, the artist can't see the woman, and the woman can't see the artist, blocked off by this curtain. And she would describe herself to him. And he's sketching, and she's saying, you know, she, he, he's asking her, you know, tell me about your cheeks, describe your chin, and he draws this picture. And then he finishes, flips the page over, and she gets up and leaves, and then somebody else comes and sits down who's one of her friends. 
And now the second person is describing the first person. So he starts drawing again, again a partition. Only now, two different drawings, same person. The first one is of how she sees herself, and the second one is how other people and her friends see her. And when he gets finished, you can compare these two pictures, and they bring the original person in, and they have this, you know, kind of dramatic commercial, and it's, and it's fascinating, but it's also, like, so heartbreaking. Because you would imagine the first picture, she is unattractive, she's cold, her features look like she's um, mean almost. In the second picture, how other people see her and experience her, she's bright, she's warm, she's attractive. And you wonder, okay, there's something going on in that person. There's some voice, some message inside of her that says that I see myself as ugly. I see myself as unacceptable. I see myself as unclean. And that voice, as you know, is inside of all of us. All of us have this voice inside of us that are telling us, there's something wrong with you. you are, you're not the right kind of person. We, we all sense this um, deep sense of, of uncleanliness. You know, it's fascinating. In our cultural moment, we, we've kind of gotten rid of objective moral standards. We've gotten rid of the idea of God. We've gotten, re- uh, gotten rid of the idea of objective moral guilt. And yet, it hasn't dealt with the feelings that we all still carry around. For example, the fact that millions and millions and millions of people flock to and have seen the Brene Brown TED Talk on shame and vulnerability and consume all of her stuff. Why? Because she's putting language to this thing that we all feel. We don't feel like we're right. We don't feel like we're enough. And now we have words that somebody's finally telling us, yes, that's what it feels like to be me. This is one of the reasons that I think is driving social media is that we, we, we post our things, we post our pictures, and we post our articles, and we're just screaming, begging for the internet to tell us that we're okay, that we're enough, that we're clean. We're trying to counteract this thing inside of us that's screaming at us, you're unclean, you're dirty, you're not right, you're not enough. Now here's the question, where in the world does that voice come from? Where does that voice come from? Look at, um, look back at the vision, in verse one, it says, and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, this is almost like a courtroom scene where you've got Joshua on trial and you've got Satan right there acting like a prosecutor who's just submitting all the evidence, listing out all of the things that Joshua has done wrong to accuse him. You see how guilty he is? You see how wrong he is? Now, I know anytime you start talking about Satan, everything kind of gets a little weird because I'm sure some of y'all are like, Satan? Like Satan, really? Like y'all believe in Vecna from you know, Stranger Things? That's what y'all are into at Redeemer? Um, but again, this is where I think it's, it's, the Bible is a lot more helpful than you might realize. Because all of us feel that voice, maybe not audibly, but just the sense inside of you. And you wonder, okay, if that voice is coming from just me, why would I do that to myself? And why not just stop? That doesn't feel good. That voice of, maybe you've heard it, it feels like this. Um, You don't deserve friends. You don't deserve to be loved. You don't deserve to belong. If that voice just came from your own head, just say, just quit. But it, it feels like you're being oppressed. It feels like you're being accused. In fact, you know that the word Satan, the Hebrew word Satan just means accuser. It feels like there's somebody accusing you. I know this is mysterious and complex, and I don't fully understand it, but here's what, here's what it might feel like for you right now. For you to be sitting here right here this morning, and, and you feel this sense inside of you that says, okay, so you're going to show up at church, and you're going to smile, and you're going to worship, and you looked at porn last night. You're a fake. You're a fraud. You don't believe this stuff. Or maybe you hear this voice and it says, um, okay, you're going you're gonna to smile and you're going to be bright and, and excited to see people at church on Sunday and you're going to be enthusiastic when you know you screamed at your 
family like a monster on the way over here. You're a fake. Now, you don't have to be religious to feel this. You don't have to be spiritual to feel this. We all, deep down, feel like frauds. We all feel like hypocrites. Um, for example, back in 2016, NPR did this interview with Tom Hanks. Now, you think about Tom Hanks, mega movie star, super successful, super beloved. You remember in uh, the, kind of the early days of COVID when Tom Hanks had it and he was in Australia and we, everyone freaked out and we were like, 2020 has been so mean and terrible. It's taken everything. Don't take Tom Hanks from us, please. Here's this person that if you would think if there's anybody because of his success, because of how much the world just loves him, this is somebody that wouldn't wrestle with this. This is somebody who wouldn't struggle with this. Here's what he says in this interview. Quote, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, there comes a point where you think, how did I get here, and am I going to be able to continue this? When, when are they going to discover that I am, in fact, a fraud and take everything away from me? It's a high-wire act that we all walk. And I do this in the work that I do because there are days when I know that 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I am going to have to deliver some degree of emotional goods. And if I can't do it, that means I'm going to have to fake it. And if I fake it, that means they may catch me at faking it. And if they catch me at faking it, well, then it's just doomsday. It's Tom Hanks. Now, he is articulating what we all feel. We all feel like frauds. We all feel accused. We all feel unclean. That's why we need cleansing, because we are unclean, and we know it. And we try to get out from under it. We try to scrub it off with social media and virtue and and self-affirmation and telling us that we're great, and yet it doesn't get deep enough to get rid of it. So how do we get rid of it? Well, how do we get it? How do we get the cleansing? Well, let's look, at, let's look at this next. Here's the next thing, how we get it. God sees Joshua covered in his filth, porta potty filth, and God rebukes not Joshua, but his accuser. Did you see that in verse 2? God says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, Satan, shut your face. These are my people. I have delivered them. They are mine, and I will make them right. And here's what he does. Look at verse 4. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. God doesn't look at Joshua and say, hey, you really need to clean yourself up. Go home, take a shower, put on some clean clothes, and then let's repeat this. He doesn't say, I want you to go out and I want you to do a bunch of good stuff. And if it outweighs all the bad stuff that you've done, then we can talk. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to tell yourself that you're beautiful and that you're good and you're the right kind of person. And when you start to believe it, then show up. He just intervenes. I'm just going to take the filth off of you. It's just a complete, unprovoked act of grace. I'm going to take your filth and remove it, which is, of course, just this picture of forgiveness, this gracious willingness of God to remove that which is wrong in us, to clean our record. Forgiveness is amazing, but here's the thing. It's not enough. Let's say that you're invited to this bougie, fancy pants wedding. You know, the kind of where people wear, you know, women wear the nice dresses and the high heels and the men have the tuxes and the cummerbunds, which is a bizarre item for anyone to wear, but cummerbunds and then, you know, tucks, you know, uh, tails, formal. And on the walk from the car to the venue, you trip and you fall in a big thing of mud and you're just covered in mud and you're disgusting, you're filthy. And it's like, there's no way, there's no way I can go into this wedding party thing now. And let's say somebody comes up and they are so gracious and they are so kind and they help remove all of those filthy garments from you, just kind of strip you down. Can you go into the wedding now? 
No, you got nothing on. Here's what's amazing about this vision is that God doesn't just remove that which is filthy in us. He doesn't just wipe the slate clean, set us up to zero, and then send us out naked, vulnerable. Isn't that what he does? He also clothes us. Look at what he says, verse 4. And I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head, and they clothed him with garments. The Lord takes away our sin and then clothes us with beauty. So we go from shame to splendor. Not shame to neutral, but shame to splendor. We go from being unacceptable to having the head seat at the table, dirty, filthy, gloriously beautiful. And you wonder, okay, that's an interesting idea. How does he do that? Well, here's what's fascinating. Think about this vision. What does the angel do with the dirty clothes? What happens to the dirty garments? You know where they go? They get put on another Joshua. Centuries after this vision, there's another high priest that comes representing God's people, and his name is Jesus, which is the Hebrew word for Joshua, Yeshua. And he shows up in, in pure, clean, righteous garments, meaning he, he perfectly loves God and he perfectly loves his neighbor. He does everything that God designed humanity to do. He doesn't feel that voice of guilt inside of him because his, his record is clean. And as this high priest comes forward to make an offering to God, you know what happens? It's like he takes off his righteous robes and he gets put on all of our filth, all of our porta potty cruelty and selfishness and hatred and perversion, all the things that are wrong with us, he gets draped up in and now he does not belong. Now he is unfit. And so the guards mock him, they laugh at him, they make jokes at his expense. And as he gets strung up on a cross, it's like he is cast out of the party. It's like God is this bouncer and says, you may not come in, you are covered in filth. And he throws him out. He's forsaken from God's presence so that you could be clothed in his righteous robes and be brought in at the head seat of the table. Jesus gets cast out so that you could be brought in. He who is righteous became guilty in God's sight so that you and I who are guilty could become righteous. He who was clean became filthy so that you and I who are filthy might become clean. The glory of the gospel is that we get credit for a life we didn't live, and Jesus gets the blame for a life that he didn't live. In fact, if you look at verse 9, it says that there's this branch, which I know is strange. This is a weird term in the, in the, Old, in the Old Testament throughout the prophets that's referring to the Messiah, that there's going to be this Messiah, this branch that's going to come in verse 9, and he will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. He will do it. He will do the cleansing. And here's, here's the thing. Here's how you get it because you can't do it yourself. Jesus has to do it for you. The way that you get it is that you come before God and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Look at everything is wrong with me. Take my filth. Give it to Jesus. Take Jesus' beauty and his record and his righteousness. Give it to me. You know what God will say? Done. Pure gift. Now, if that's how you get this cleansing, here's the last question. Who cares? Why does this matter? And here's where I wish I had like three more hours because the, the, this really does change everything. You know, if you picture like a lake that's smooth as glass and you throw a giant rock out into the middle of it and it just sends all these ripples in every single direction, when the gospel of grace drops into your soul, it ripples out in every single direction. It changes everything about you. Everything. But I'm just going to show you two really quick, because we don't have three hours. So two, real quick. Two images that I didn't talk about in this story that I want to um, show you. Here's, here's the first. The first image is in verse 9. It's this, it's this image of a stone with seven eyes on it. I mean, this is really weird. I told you this is, this is bizarro. But the stone was set in, in, the, in the priest's turban that was, that was on their head, and it was kind of right here on their forehead. 
And the seven eyes thing is confusing. Scholars disagree over what that means. I think it really just means that it, it represents God's l- looking at it intently. But the, the point is that it's engraved with something. There's this inscription on the stone. You don't know what it is. It just says it has this engraved inscription on it. It's this mystery, what's written on it. You don't find out until the end of the story. The last book of the Bible in the book of Revelation, it takes, takes up all of this imagery and it tells us that what's written on our foreheads is Christ's name. Now, this is all symbolic. This isn't literal. But, but what, it's, what it's meaning is that when the gospel of grace gets in you, when you become his, he labels you. He marks you. You are identified as his. You belong to him. And here's what's fascinating. It is written in stone, which means it's secure. You can't screw it up. You can't undo it. You can't mess it all up. It's not like God looks at you and thinks, well, On this particular day, they did pretty good, so I'm going to be a little bit more inclined to be nice to them, and maybe I'll answer some of their prayers. But, you know, this next day when they messed up and screwed up, I'm going to withhold a little bit. Maybe I'll, you know, not be as kind to them. If this thing is written in stone, this means that God's opinion of you does not fluctuate. It does not change day to day. He does not love you any more or any less than he already does because his opinion of you is not based off of you. It's based off of Jesus' righteousness that he earned for you. And if that's true, if that means it is set, if his love and his favor has been indelibly imprinted upon you, do you know what that does? That frees you to rest, that you no longer have to continue the anxious hustle and hurry of trying to prove to yourself and to everyone around you that you're enough and that you're the right kind of person. It gives you inner spiritual, psychological resources to rest. You're you're free to stop pretending to be somebody that is, is better than you actually are. There's no, there's, you're free to stop hiding. You're free to own your failures. Because here's what's fascinating. In this story, you know, Satan does have a case. In fact, most of the accusations that he makes against us are probably true. And when you hear those accusations, you hear those voices, it just feels so crushing. But if you believe the gospel, you can say, you know what, everything that you're saying about me is probably true. And guess what? Jesus has an answer for all of them. He's paid for every single one of those accusations. So yes, in myself, dirty, filthy, but guess what? I'm wearing his righteousness. He's my righteousness. He's my identity. I am in him and he is in me. Freedom. Now here's the second image, and then we're done. The second image from this story is um, in verse uh, 10, this vine and fig tree. You see it at the end? In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Now, you might remember this language if you're uh, familiar with Hamilton, the musical. Remember, uh, this language is is sung by George Washington as he is um, stepping down from being president. And he says, I want to sit under my own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. Remember that? You know that's a Bible verse? You know he's quoting Micah 4.4 in that song in Hamilton, which means that this language of a fig tree and a vine, this is, it's threaded all throughout the Bible, and just it's this idea that captures flourishing, captures it's this idea of shalom, of, of abundance, And here's what I want you to notice is that the goodness of the gospel is not intended merely for personal consumption. It's intended to be shared. You see it, it says, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come into this flourishing. God never gives you grace and then just puts a period at the end of the sentence. There's always a comma. He gives you grace so that you would give it away. He never invites you in without also sending you out, which means that this cleansing, this beauty, this glory, this goodness is not just designed for the church. It's designed for our neighbors too. 
that this whole story is not just for Redeemer, it's also for Midtown. This is why what we do as a church here is we gather together to rest, to get off of the hamster wheel, to be reminded of his love and to collapse into his goodness and his favor once again. And then we hang out with one another and we remind each other, right? You are loved. Yes, you are clean. He loves you. He is for you. It's inscribed on your very face. But then what? Then we reflect that love to our friends and to our neighbors. It's too good to just keep for us. And so we give ourselves away so that our, our, our neighbors here in Midtown might in some way get a taste, a glimpse of the beauty of this flourishing that, that is offered. That they might see Jesus as more beautiful and believable than maybe they realized before because of the way that we see they see us loving them, pursuing them, giving our lives away for them. So here's the bottom line. Come to Jesus and be cleansed and then give it away. That's an invitation for you. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you give us resources that are supernatural, that are beyond us as we wrestle with our own insecurities, our own sense of being frauds, our own sense of being unclean, that you speak good words to us. You give us permission to rest and to collapse into your arms. Father, I, pr I pray that you would um, give us a renewed appetite in, the, in the, the sweetness of your grace that we might drink from it more frequently, more deeply that we might be transformed into every area of our lives, that we would give ourselves away for the one who gave himself away for us. Bless us and keep us, we pray. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to God's word and let's stand and sing before the throne of God above. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within a word I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin because the sinless Savior died Yeah. 
righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. What with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior I God, with Christ my Savior I God. This table is where the gospel of grace really comes to life, because what we do is we approach it with nothing. We approach it with our feelings of feeling filthy and feeling guilty and feeling like we're not enough, and then what are we met with? We're met with a meal, a free meal, and there's no splitting the check. It's all on him. This is all an offer for him, from him. And so if that, if that invitation to come to Jesus doesn't sound good to you, if that sounds strange to you, you are totally free to not come forward. You can stay in your seat when, when we come forward in just a second. If you want to come forward and just cross your hands but not partake and, and have us pray for you, we would love to do something like that as well. But, but you, you are free to not come. This is a table for those who, who know deep down that they have a great need for a Savior, and they also have a great Savior for their need. So let's pray this prayer of thanksgiving together as we come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is right to give you thanks and to give you praise that when you had every right to cast us out. You brought us in. You, you, you qualified us by your very grace, by your son. And Father, as we come to this table, help us to eat and to drink that grace, that it might uh, become 3D to us, not just theoretical, not just words that go in one ear and out the other, but help us to take this in, to absorb it, for it to metabolize in our bodies so that we would be changed from the inside out. Take these normal, ordinary elements and use them by your spirit to strengthen us, to transform us, to sustain us, to remind us of your goodness. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, and it's broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which was poured out for you, poured out for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread, as often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This is the good news. This is our hope. And this is the mystery of our faith. Let's proclaim it together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In just a few moments, hey, Gibson, I thought he was just going to keep just coming. Hey, buddy, first in line. Um, <laughs> in just a few moments, we're going to approach um, the center aisle. We'll have two stations on, on either side up here, and we'll have uh, a gluten-free option for the bread if you need it. Just let us know. Uh, well, the, the wine is all in the inner rings, and the grape juice is on the outermost ring of the, of the tray. And you'll come forward, and you can take the elements right there if you're choosing to take, and then go back to your seats on the outer rows and drop off your empty cup in the little basket as you go. Uh, I think that is it for instruction. So can, can those who are assisting with the meal come forward at this time?
My feet are strong My eyes are clear I cannot see the way from here But on we go He knows the way And in his arms he keeps Fear not, keep on watching, pray, walk in the light of God's highway. The shadows flee. Cannot conquer me. Your rod and staff, they protect me. You give me rest, you give me peace. Fear not, keep on. Why? This tiny ship that carries me, it is not yet, but it will be, so heaven come, it's here we be, fear not. as we sing our last song, Arise, My Soul, Arise. Arise. 
Arise, my soul, arise, and shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hand. Thank you for being with us this morning and honoring us with your presence. As we go, let us go forth to love, to serve Midtown, our city, and the world as those who are loved by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Hear now this final word from God as we go. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.